Hi, folks. Welcome to today's webinar from Bob Benny Wealth Management. I'm Bob Benny. I'm Jesse Thompson. And uh, today our topic is retirement income planning. And we kind of call it Retirement 101. And uh, go ahead and tell them, Jess, how to ask questions and how things are going to go in the Sure. Agenda. If you think of any questions while we're going through things, you can type them in. If you just type the, if you, um, there's a box on the bottom of your screen that you can click to type your questions in and we'll go over everything. At the end of the webinar, you can also email me or email my dad um, if you think of anything that comes up afterwards. That's jesse at bobbenny.com or bob at bobbenny.com. Also, we welcome any kind of feedback you have if you think of something that, uh, uh, a topic that you'd like us to do in future webinars or, or any kind of uh, constructive criticism. We'd, uh, we just want to make this better and more helpful for you. Yep. So in this webinar, we're going to go over the basic things of retirement income planning. And so the five basic things that make up a good, efficient retirement plan would be, first off, um, you have to determine what your expenses are going to be in, in retirement to get kind of a ballpark estimate of what kind of uh, cash flow that you're going to need. The second thing is figuring out when to start Social Security and what the strategy is going to be for that. That's especially important um, if you're married, determining when each of you is going to start that. Third, how much you need to save for retirement and how your investments are going to play a role in your retirement income. Um, fourth, long-term care considerations, if you're worried about possible, the possibility of having to go into a nursing home at some point in your retirement. And lastly, your estate plan and how you plan on um, leaving your assets to your loved ones. So we're going to get started so, and start off first with uh, how you can determine your income need in retirement. So obviously the first thing is you got to figure out what your expenses are and and there's a couple of different ways you can get real specific or you can get general. One of the ways that I've done over the last 27 years of helping people with this is, is basically look at what your income is that you're, that you're getting from your job prior to your retirement. Now, you know, how much, some of that, obviously you're not um, getting to, to spend, but we can look at your net. Uh, we can look at what, and then look at what things might change um, in your retirement. Um, and so there's a couple of different uh, calculator worksheets that uh, we want to show you uh, that Jesse uh, pulled up here. And we're going to um, mail them to email. email them, I mean, to yeah. everybody that's signed up for this webinar. This is just the first one is a quick retirement budget worksheet. And, and it's from the AARP. And, you know, as you see at the top there, it says your current income from employment. And then the, the two main things are adding expenses that are expected to rise when you retire and subtracting expenses that are expected to decline when you retire. And, and it doesn't have to be exact, uh, but this is kind of a starting point. And don't, I do this with, all, with people all the time without just verbally, without even um, going through the, the, the worksheet, but if you like to see things on paper, this is a good tool. Right. And then if, if you kind of are one of those people that doesn't maybe have a specific budget or you kind of look at your cash flow as it comes in and then what's left over after your expenses, but don't exactly know where all your expenses are during the year, that's a good thing to look at before you retire. And this is another tool that we're gonna attach and send out in case that's something that you've never done where you can go through here and look at all of your required expenses that you have to pay every month or, or throughout the year. And then also your discretionary spending and kind of get an idea of, of what you're actually spending um, every month. But keep in mind the way that this, the way that retirement income planning works and has worked for me with all of our client, me and Jesse with all of our clients over the years is it's a moving target. And so we just, as people retire, we, we, we come up with them what their, you know, how much income they're gonna need from their investments that we're managing for them a month. Um, set it up to maybe automatically transfer from their account into their um, into their bank account at a certain day of the month of their choosing, but it's a moving target, mm -hmm. is my point. And so, you know, 
maybe they say after six months of it that, well, you know, I'm not using all this money. I don't really need this much. And we lower it or the opposite and, and we increase it or maybe they need a lump sum or whatever. But it is a moving target. It's just a way of getting a, a starting point is coming up with these, um, uh, using these worksheets if necessary to come up with uh, a starting point for in total income in retirement. And, and then the, the, another thing that a person needs to keep in mind at retirement, especially now, is this, this super high inflation that we're going through. And, and you know, it's as you're looking at expenses, uh, some of those expenses that you have are fixed expen expenses, and some are going to be variable expenses. And most of those variable expenses, unfortunately, are going to go up with inflation. So the more fixed expenses that you can have for yourself and have planned out for your retirement, the better. And a couple of ways to look at those, or a couple of main expenses, I guess, to consider is your health care. Um, when you retire and become eligible for Medicare, you have two choices for your health care. You can get on regular Medicare and supplement that with a Medicare supplement policy, or you can um, have your Medicare kind of bundled into one thing called a uh, Medicare Advantage plan. And you have either or, and you're stuck with whichever one you choose for the remainder of your retirement. So it's important um, that you choose which one is best for you because you can't jump back and forth between one or the other very easily. And there's so, a big difference for most people there's a bit, there's fixed versus versus variable expenses. So with a Medicare Advantage plan, that's the plan that's all bundled and those look very attractive to people right off the bat on Medicare because the premiums per month uh, look relatively inexpensive. But your costs when you actually have to go to get care are variable and, and, and they can change every year as well. And so you put yourself at risk for having high, costs when you actually need to go get care. On the other hand, if you get a Medicare supplement policy, all you do is it has a little bit of a higher premium, but you pay that premium every month and you know exactly what your costs for your care are going to be. Because like if you get a Medicare, um, Medicare plan G is the most popular Medicare supplement plan and the one that we recommend to people. If you get a Medicare plan G, all you're paying is your plan G premium your Medicare premium, and then you have like a $200 deductible for the year for anything that would go on with your health. So you know exactly worst case scenario, basically, what your expenses are going to be if you incur any kind of health issue down the line. And so um, that's a good consideration as well for when you're looking at trying to figure out how to fix your health expenses as much as possible. And then the other thing to consider would be your housing and your living expenses. And so if you have a home, your mortgage is going to be a fixed expense and that's better than hopefully, hopefully. Let's say a variable rate mortgage, which I hope nobody has. But uh, but that that's a lot better than renting and not knowing how much rent is going to go up with inflation or throughout your retirement, even in normal inflation, it's just better to have that as a controlled expense uh, rather than one that you have to risk being variable, especially when a lot of people are on fixed income. And we've had a number of clients in the last year or so that I, we've been advising um, that we're renting and considering buying a home that uh, we've encouraged to go ahead and buy, even though real estate prices are high, I believe they're going to continue to go up with inflation and they will. But even more importantly, interest rates are going up and they've already gone up substantially on fixed mortgages. And so, uh, uh, but they're still at interest rates that you're better off than you could be. And uh, you can lock that in with a purchase of a home or a townhouse or whatever and, and lock that payment in, except for probably the rising costs of property taxes and insurance. So that's another thing to, con to consider. Point number two on our agenda is when to start and how to start Social Security payments. Uh, and, and, and we have a calculator that we're going to show you in a little bit. It's a Social Security analysis software that we use to help people uh, figure out when and how to take Social Security. Um, but the, one of the key things people need to know is you can take it as early as 62, but if you take it as early as 62, there's going to be a 30% reduction 
in your primary social security, which is at age 67, the, you know, what they call the primary insurance amount or in that what it's called PIA at full retirement age. Mm -hmm. The government likes to use all these abbreviations. Full retirement age is FRA, FRA, primary insurance amount is the, the, uh, uh, the amount you get at age 67. Anyway, if you take before 67, it's 30% less, and that goes on for the rest of your life, 30% less than what mm -hmm. you would have otherwise got. If you wait past age 67, um, they increase it 8% every year up until age 69. You can wait again until it's age 70, but it's not a benefit because it doesn't increase in, in. And so we use this as social security analysis to, to help people figure out when to take. Sometimes people can retire and uh, want to wait to take social security so that they can get a higher social security amount or whatever, but we'll help you figure it out. <clears throat> Some of the different kind of considerations that you want to look at is your life expectancy, uh, your spouse and what their social security benefit is and how that works with uh, uh, maybe a higher, a higher income earning spouse and a, and a, say that's the husband and a stay-at-home mom who doesn't have a very high um, uh, social security benefit, um, that stay-at-home spouse that doesn't have the high social security benefit will get, when they apply, half of what the, the, the higher income earning spouses. We'll figure all that stuff out. So there's a lot of specifics, which is what makes this tool that we use very helpful for people in determining what their best um, most ideal scenario would be. And we're going to show you an example of that. Um, this is just an example client and spouse that we plugged in here. And this ends up being a, a, a like a dozen page report. But um, one of the things I want to remember that I didn't, that was down in our notes that I forgot to mention is you don't want to take social security until at least until you stop working mm -hmm. because it gets taxed. If yep. you're making very much money at all, it gets it gets taxed, and it's it, it's not that it's taxed. It gets taxed a lot, and you don't want to do it. They withhold but, a portion of your benefits. Right, they withhold part so of your benefits, and it, it gets taxed and taxed, and it's not worth it. So don't be tempted to take Social Security at age 62, even though you're still working and planning on working until 65. Well, let's go back to the Social Security analysis thing, Jess, and show them that. So what this does, and we won't get completely into this, but it takes all the different possible claiming ages and strategies for an individual or a couple and runs them out to their life expectancy, which we, we input in there and we can change for different things. And it shows in this strategy comparison that we're looking at right here, it shows the present value dollars of all the future Social Security payments out to somebody's life expectancy, if they die exactly at the age that their life expectancy is, is the present value dollars. And in the red bar of $382,568, that's the present value if you take early or take at your earliest time. Both people take, uh, both spouses take it at age um, 62. And then the, four, the blue bar is the suggested strategy to maximize the present value dollars. And it may not be possible for people to do that because, you know, if we click on that, um, that's going to show both of them not, not taking Social Security until 69. Well, maybe they want to retire at 65 and they can't wait until 69. And so, um, it, 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 you know, in that case, that wouldn't be doable. But Go ahead and close that. And back to the thing, then we can make alter, our own alternate strategies um, with any kind of ages that we want with this and, uh, and do that too. So, but one of the things that it does is really neat that we show people, and you can click maybe on the red bar. So this is uh, these folks um, both taking Social Security at age 62, the earliest they can. And the green line, if you highlight that and go through, go along that, just the green line is their income need that we've estimated what their income need, uh, and it's going up over time for inflation. And then the the bars below are their social security, the husband and the wife, and the blue and the black social security, 
and their first full year of taking Social Security is 2023 in this example. And if we go up to the green bar again, Jess, it shows that their income need, just in this example, this couple's income need, total income living expenses need is just under $37,000. Their total Social Security is just under 20,000, 19,932. So their gap of income, the amount of income that they need to fill in the gap between their Social Security and their uh, income need is $17,000. Well, where do you get the gap? Well, you get the gap from things like pensions or part-time job or income from your investments or whatever. And that's how we help people um, figure out um, what their, you know, when they need to retire and where the money's coming from and that sort of thing. And if we close this and just quickly click over to the blue one, the suggested, just I wanna show that if they're able to wait until 69 to take social security, the gap is far less. Mm -hmm. Obviously that's gonna happen, but it depends. It's always on an individual case basis. There's no one, one, one size fits all solution for when to take social security and so um, we'll help you or your friends or anybody you know that needs some help in figuring out their social security timing um, with this tool for free for free for free so social security timing social security is a good place to start because for a lot of people that's just a given for their retirement income and so to figure out that gap we have another really awesome tool um, that we can use that illustrates that in a visual way for people yeah. that I feel like makes it really easy to understand. So now we're on our third point on our agenda, Jesse. How much you need to save for retirement and how to utilize your investments to fund your retirement. So this tool she's going to show us is, I think it's the best tool I've ever seen uh, in the business for helping figure out um, helping figure out income needs in retirement. And this is called Riskalyze. And before we get into it, um, this is example clients, Herbie and Henrietta Husker, we named them. They went through a brief questionnaire process with us and came up with a risk number. That's the number set risk 70 in the white box there. And this product or this software analyzes their current investments and gives them a risk number and an expected rate of return. And then if we were to give them a proposal, it would tell what the proposal's risk number is and the expected rate of return. And then when we're over here, show them kind of hover over the retirement map thing, Jess. Over here on the retirement map part, that's where we help figure out um, uh, income and, and how much income people can take from their investments safely. Um, and so what we've got here, you can scroll on down now. So this is with their these folks' current portfolio and scroll down a little bit more. And, and it is a 70, actually. It's the right risk number. It's just not invested the best. And so what, what this is set up is they've got a, in this hypothetical example, they have a half a million dollars in retirement investments they're saving $800 a month in retirement, planning on retiring in 2025, and then taking $3,000 a month to supplement their social security. That's what they need to meet. That's what their gap is, is about 36,000 a year. Um, has a life expectancy for both of them down there at, at, at age 90. So if we scroll up um, just to this, this is showing the probability of Henry and Herbie uh, Husker living to age 90 without running out of money. And it's a 68% probability. And it's kind of in red and it's it's kind of scary looking. And we don't, we don't obviously like that. We don't want that. We want better than 90%, actually better than 95% probability of being able to make it to 90 without running out of money. If you look on this on this chart, it's showing on the on the in the red line that she's highlighting right now the account value and the performance of the account with the projected exact rate of return. Well, we know investments don't do that mm -hmm. with standard deviation and variation and whatever they can be higher or lower. And so 
what this the shaded area is showing how much they could be above or below and as you can notice out there keep scrolling a little bit right there in in uh uh january of 2008 they potentially could run 2038 they potentially could run out of money and that's why there's a a 68 per, per, percent probability of not running out of money before they run out of breath uh, it, with their current investments and the current um uh, withdrawal rates and stuff this tool also uses J jesse can hover over the withdrawal only 22 or 2100 dollars a month instead of the 300 that they need they could cut their expenses and withdraw less and get to a safer probability of 92 percent they can wait to retire in 2030 uh or they could save eighty one hundred dollars a month and then they'd be okay but one of the things that we did in this example was we showed we're showing we our proposed portfolio and so this is how we do it so she's going to click on that and apply that now we've got the same the same investment amount the same savings until retirement in 2025 and the the $3,000 a month withdrawal but when Jesse scrolls up these folks had with, with the different just a different portfolio same risk number same amount of risk of a 70 but but just adjusting the investments and having better performing investments in there gives them a 95 percent plus probability of living to 90 without running out of money and that so that's kind of how we and we can we can take any existing um uh, recipe of investments and enter them in here like we did these folks and 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 input the life expectancy and input the savings rate input the retirement year and input the amount of money that they want to take out and and uh, uh safely figure out the retirement income plan for uh the client or the prospective client so another thing I want to touch on briefly is 401ks, because that's usually a large portion of most people, um, if they have an employer, most of their retirement savings. And so something that you're going to want to think about is, I think a lot of people get really comfortable in their 401k, especially if they've worked at a place for a very long amount of time, right. they're comfortable with the investments that they're in and things like that. Um, but when you retire, and you need to start taking retirement income. If you take it directly out of that 401k and don't roll it over into an IRA, they'll mandatory, it's a mandatory withholding of 20% federal taxes, which is for most people more than what they're actually going to need to withhold. And so you don't want to withdraw money out of your 401k. You want to roll it over into an IRA and then withdraw money at the right um tax percentages from your IRA. Because otherwise what you're doing is you're giving the government, you're going to get that money back. Let's say you only really needed 10%. Your tax rate's only going to be 10%. If you're withholding 20%, you'll get the money back when you do your taxes a year later. But why give the government your money? And it can no it could have been stated, it could have been invested that entire time. Instead, right. you're lending it to right. the government. So for most people, it's best to roll it over to an IRA so they can put in whatever amount they want, if, if anything, for withholding. And a reminder as well that when you turn 72, you're going to have to start taking distributions from your retirement funds, no matter what. Uh, so you need to have it in an IRA, at least by the time you're 72, even if you don't need to take income off of it. Another advantage of having it in an IRA rather than the 401k plan is the flexibility of investment options. So in your 401k, you're limited to whatever investment options, and there, there's usually only a few that you can choose. Whereas 10, if you, 20 maybe at the mm -hmm, most. Whereas if you roll it into an IRA, you can invest it in practically anything you want in the stock market or um, bonds different different things you just have a lot more uh options for managing it and something that you can do with your 401k if you're getting close to retirement age as long as you're 59 and a half or over even if you're still working and not retiring yet you can roll over your 401k into an ira they call it an in-service withdrawal so you could completely leave the 401k open still be contributing to it your employer's contributing to it but you can take a big chunk of it and roll it over into an ira so that you can be managing it and investing it in 
most likely whatever you want, whatever you want. And, and a lot better, of, better options than are available in your 401 We have a lot of people do that while they're still working and they're nearing retirement, but they're not there yet because they want our professional management investments that we use and the advice that we give. And uh, so, so that's another thing that you can do with your 401k potentially is an in-service withdrawal. One of the things that's really important, especially right now, but also for everybody, it's always been important in retirement, but especially right now, is can your investments uh, keep up with inflation? Because inflation is the biggest financial threat to all Americans right now. And it's here and it's gonna get worse and it's gonna be around for a while. And so fixed investments are not good investments for high inflation, whether it's savings accounts, checking accounts, cash, CDs, or bonds, those aren't good things for inflation. You're gonna lose buying power with those investments. The best investments for inflation, for, for, for hedging against inflation, we believe are companies, income producing real estate and gold. I don't like gold as much because it doesn't produce any rent like real estate does. And it doesn't produce the goods and services whose prices are going up with inflation, which is why companies are a great hedge against inflation. Historically, and we can show you this, um, the stock market is, is the best hedge against inflation. And even in the times, uh, we, we've got a calculator that we show people that in, in times that we had before of really outrageously high inflation, the late 70s and early 80s, um, the stock market not only kept up with inflation, but you still earned money and stayed ahead of inflation. So um, uh, there's also products, if you're nervous about the stock market, there are products that we can show you that uh, protect your money from the standpoint of guaranteed income and guaranteed uh, uh, death, benefits. Ben death benefits for your kids or your beneficiaries. And they charge for that. They're insurance type products. They charge for that insurance charge one or 2% for those guarantees, but sometimes feel people feel like that they're willing to sacrifice that one or 2% in order to have the peace of mind for the income uh, benefits and the, and the death benefits. So that brings us to our next point, point number four, uh, which is long-term care considerations uh, for clients. I've been doing retirement planning and investment with for folks with folks for 27 years and I'm licensed so is Jesse to sell long-term care insurance but long-term care insurance is oversold it's uh it's oversold it, it has very high commissions maybe that's one of the motivations that uh causes uh, insurance agents to to really push it and they use fear fear of of because everybody's it seems like everybody knows somebody that went into a nursing home and was in there for 10 or 20 or whatever years and it used up all their money or uh, had to sell the farm or whatever but long-term care insurance is very expensive by the time many people start thinking about it it's too expensive for most of our clients that we've run across that i've run across in my 27 years how long you've been in this business jess most of these people, they have enough assets that they can self-insure. The insurance people that are trying to sell long-term care insurance want to sell it to everybody. The real people that it might be appropriate for are in a very narrow window because many people have enough assets that they can self-insure. And then people that don't have enough assets and really can't afford uh, a long-term care insurance premium uh, they're best off just using up their assets. If the, maybe they only have $50,000 worth of assets or $100,000 worth of assets, they're better off taking their chances, I guess, so to speak, hoping they don't go in a nursing home. If they do, they have to spend down their assets before Medicaid pays for it. But, and that's better than a couple thousand dollar a month long term care policy or something like that. But some facts about long-term care is only about 50% of people ever end up in a nursing home. And many of them 
that's just for rehab from an injury and they go back home, but some of them end up in a nursing home until they pass. The average length, length of stay in a nursing home is, is around a year. It's dropped significantly in recent years. And over 50% of the people that go in a nursing home uh, pass away within six months. So, and that's the way that your grandpa, my dad, was. He was in there for right about six months, didn't have long-term care insurance. Neither does mom, neither do I, neither do your mom, neither does your mom. So just if that means anything to you, and it isn't like we're rich, but we 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 know the ins and outs of long-term care insurance. Another thing finally, and then I'll finish on long-term care insurance, Jesse, is that something that some people don't take into consideration, but they should. If if you go into long-term care, you're not going to need your house if you're going to be in there, you know, for the rest of your life. And so that's certainly an asset that can be used to pay for uh, long-term care. The last thing that we want to talk about is estate planning. Um, this is important because if you don't have an estate plan, you do have an estate plan and your plan is to go have all of your assets go through probate. Which is not a good plan. Which is not a good plan. Probate, um, first off, it's hard on whoever you're leaving those assets to, whoever is in charge of your state, your estate, it takes months to years to do, and it can take up to 10%, it can cost up to 10% of your estate uh, to go through probate. And that whole court process just makes things much more difficult than they need to be. And I think a lot of people think that they have an estate plan if they have a will, but a will is not an estate plan. A will is actually just a letter to the probate court. So when some when the when the court is executing your will or your will is getting executed you've already kind of lost because you're already in probate and so the way that you can completely avoid probate and the only way to do it is to have a trust that's properly set up it's called a revocable living trust we help people with this and you know nobody that i know when we've ever uh you know, designated beneficiaries, for instance, for their IRA, nobody I know ever uh, designates five or 10% or whatever it's going to be to the probate court or to probate lawyers. So it's not your intention. But if you have a house, for instance, and you pass away and that house is in your name, it's going, going to go through the probate process. A revocable living trust uh, that we can help you design uh, online with a company called LegalZoom, and it's not very expensive. The trust and all the ancillary documents is about $450. Um, we don't get paid anything. Um, once you create that trust and sign it and then retitle the house in the name of the trust, it doesn't go through probate. When you pass away, for instance, the house, that's the example I keep using, the house, the farm, the car, the bank account, whatever this title in the name of the trust, it's controlled then by your successor trustee. You're the trustee while you're alive. After you pass, the successor trustee's in charge of it. And they're in charge of managing and distributing the assets title in the name of the trust upon your passing. The, the estate plans that we do also include not only the revocable living trust I'm talking about, but powers of attorney for for finances and health care, living wills, all that sort of stuff. Uh, they're very, and, and, and we do this all the time for people, help them do their own uh, through this service called LegalZoom. And we'd love to help you or your friends or family if, they'd, uh, if they're interested in looking at this. So that wraps up our five main things um, that we wanted to go through about the basics of retirement planning. We're going to address any questions right now. So if you think of one last minute, go ahead and type it in or you can email it to us later. Um, here is a question from somebody who's a veteran. They're covered by the VA. Do I need Medicare? Um, I believe you do. At the age of 65, for everybody, even though that retirement age with Social Security is full retirement age is 67, you can take as early as 62, but for everybody, you qualify for Medicare at age 65. If you're still working um, and your employer has a good retirement or a good insurance plan, most people stay on the employer's uh, insurance plan rather than going on Medicare. But but most of us at some point are going to be done with work and are going to go on 
go on Medicare. And, um, um, I used to do a lot of Medicare insurance, and we have somebody now um, that we refer people to that handles all of that kind of stuff. So if you're reaching kind of that Medicare age and you want to figure out exactly how it all works and if you need a Medicare supplement, how to sign up for that and all that stuff, I can give you this guy's phone number. He's really great and, and he'll help you out. We thank you all for attending our webinar today. Uh, we're here to help. Um, and so if you have any, you know, comments or questions, you can email them to jesse at bobbenny.com or bob at bobbenny.com. And we'd be glad to help you or any of your friends or family with a social security analysis, a retirement map, help you with your 401k estate, estate planning, any kind of money involved questions. Uh, we're here to help and uh, here to serve you. So thanks again for attending today. Thank you. Have a great week.